Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you as always from here in the podcasting studios at the Czech Media Group, one of our Chamber Champions. I would like to acknowledge as always that I am living and working in the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen speaking nations known to us as Songhees and Esquimalt or Kosapsum. And all of this with Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union who are redefining what banking can do for people, for communities and for the world. Well, our population is growing. The way that we live our lives is changing all the time. And one of the things that we need to be conscious of as we grow our communities, grow our lives, grow our businesses, is do we have enough energy to fulfill all the needs that we're going to have going forward? Between the increase in our population, the increase in housing, uh, the uh, influx of electric vehicles, all of those things are putting strains on our energy system. We want to talk about that today with a company that I have a feeling you maybe don't know enough about that you should know about. You know the name Fortis. But you may not know everything about this remarkable company. And joining me to talk about that is Roger Dell'Antonio. He is the CEO of Fortis BC and Fortis BC Energy Incorporated. Roger, how are you? Good, Bruce. Thanks very much for the invite. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, so I think a lot of us here in Greater Victoria know Fortis as the company that provides us with natural gas for our heating needs. But in actuality, Fortis is much more than just a natural gas company. So can you explain that to me? Yeah, for sure, Bruce. So, yeah, agreed. Most of you, uh, most of your listeners will know us as a utility delivering natural gas and renewable gases across BC, including uh, the island. About 15% of our gas customers across the province are actually on Vancouver Island. Uh, but to your point, we're also a vertically integrated electric utility serving the South Okanagan and the Kootenay region of BC, where we serve just under 200,000 homes and businesses and own and operate uh, five hydroelectric dams uh, uh, in the uh, in the Kootenays, just off the Columbia River. So uh, on the gas side, our company traces our roots back to street lighting, actually, on Yates Street, I think 1861, 1862, thereabouts. And our electric business started here in BC in 1897. So on both sides of uh, the business, we have a long and storied history serving BC. I think what's really interesting about our business is we are very much a community organization. We serve about 135 communities, uh, along with 58 Indigenous communities across the province. On the island, we serve 25 local governments, 15 First Nations, and six regional uh, districts. And and one last point about uh, who we are. We are part of the Fortis Inc. group of companies. Now, Fortis is a holding company based in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Uh, We're the largest of their five Canadian subsidiaries. They have 10 subsidiaries in total. And of those 10 companies that make up the Fortis Group, we're the second largest uh, on terms of customer served uh, assets and number of employees. Uh, Fortis itself is comprised of about 99% regulated utility companies uh, with over 90% of the assets in the delivery of energy, uh, the majority of which is electricity. I raise that information only to underline that we have a deep experience across the energy infrastructure spectrum, even though most of your listeners will know us as the gas utility. um, We take a very wide uh, view of energy delivery and have deep expertise across the energy spectrum. So you are, in fact, the province's largest energy provider, right, in BC, Fortis is. Yeah, Yeah, if we look at uh, it based on an annual basis, on an end use basis, BC Hydro delivers about 18 to 20 percent of the end use energy in British Columbia. We uh, are about uh, about 20 to 22 percent end use energy. So similar, but on a combined electric and gas basis, we are uh, the largest uh, energy uh, delivery company. Uh, What's really important about those numbers, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit, is that uh, our systems do work a little bit differently. uh, On we deliver most of our energy on the gas side of the business. Um, in the cold winter months, because most of our load is space heating, hot water heating, thermal energy applications. So when we have a very cold winter day, like we had in January of this year, and we had record cold temperatures across the province, um, our system is designed that it delivers about twice the amount of energy as BC Hydro does on those cold peak winter days. So a lot of people, again, would have maybe assumed that BC Hydro is the largest energy provider in BC, but in fact, it is Fortis. But you do work together with BC Hydro, right? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, we've got a strong working uh, relationship uh, on a number of different fronts. In in some instances, uh, BC Hydro has actually been a customer of ours. We serve natural gas uh, 
over to uh, the Island Cogen plant, uh, which um, BC Hydro buys electricity from. Uh, on our electric side of the business, we uh, supply or procure a lot of the electricity uh, that we need for our electric customers from BC Hydro. Uh, on a more granular level, we work closely together on integrated resource planning uh, in front of our regulator, the British Columbia Utility uh, Corporation, the BCUC. Uh, they uh, regulate both ourselves and BC Hydro. And uh, we do joint modeling for future energy scenarios together. Uh, we also have a long history of collaborating on energy efficiency programs in BC. Our teams work together to come up with seamless offerings to our both our sets of customers. Uh, we also find ourselves supporting initiatives in local communities. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were uh, both sponsors for Orange Shirt Day uh, to raise awareness about residential schools. Uh, we uh, show up in other uh, community initiatives like that together. Um, I would also say one thing that's uh, uh, not often talked enough about is what we call mutual aid. So we support each other during and after emergencies. Last year, when we had uh, the wildfires that went through the Okanagan in West Kelowna and Kelowna, we worked together uh, collaboratively dealing with the situation when the fire was occurring. Uh, but also uh, when infrastructure needed to be rebuilt in the West Kelowna area, which is served by BC Hydro, uh, a lot of our crews were working along with BC Hydro to help restore service to British Columbia in that area as quickly as possible. And when we have situations like that, we've often called on support from BC Hydro. Yeah, in, in the fire circumstance, for example, there were a lot of hydro pools that literally burned up and fell. Yeah. So that's where you collaborate on that. So natural gas is extracted for the uses that you guys have. But I'd like to know what is what is renewable natural gas? Because that's kind of yeah, the future, Yeah, no, that's right? a great question. There's a lot of information uh, and maybe misunderstanding on what a renewable natural gas is. And for the purposes of this, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it to RNG okay. uh, to make it easier. So uh, RNG is... is uh, gas, methane gas, which is what natural gas effectively is. Uh, and that's made from decaying organic matter. So that can come from food waste. Uh, it can come from uh, landfills. It can come from wastewater treatment plants. It can come from farm waste. Um, these are all uh, decaying organic matter. Um, the gas from uh, a landfill or a wastewater treatment plant uh, is uh, that we collect that's already part of the the natural carbon cycle. It's a uh, it's you know that that uh, matter will decay and release carbon into the atmosphere uh, by capturing that uh, that gap those off gases from the decaying matter matter. We run that through a process either through uh, an anaerobic uh, digestion process or we run it through uh, other chemical process to take out impurities uh, and then. Uh, what we'll do is put that into our pipeline system uh, and deliver it to people's homes and businesses as part of our uh, natural gas uh, system. And because we are taking an already existing carbon molecule, if you will, uh, that's uh, going to be put into the atmosphere and uh, before it's combusted, we uh, do not add a, a new gas molecule to the system. It's displacing uh, a new molecule, which will be combusted. So therefore it's carbon neutral. So when you talk about that science, the extraction from um, uh, uh, landfill sites, for example, we're going to make that a very local story in just a second when we continue this conversation. Chamber Chats today, we were talking with Roger Delantonia. He is the CEO of Fortis BC. So you talked uh, about energy renewal and energy extraction from landfills. So Rogers, let's talk, Roger, rather, let's talk in particular about what you do here in Greater Victoria at Heartland. Yeah, so uh, that's a great example. Uh, so the Heartland landfill, uh, which is being uh, constructed just outside of uh, Victoria, uh, we've negotiated a, a long-term deal with the Heartland facility we will uh, be uh, buying what is called landfill gas uh, from that uh, from that landfill. Uh, it'll go through a process to uh, basically purify the landfill gas to uh, pipeline specification methane. Um, uh, we will then inject that into a six kilometer uh, pipeline system that will connect 
the land, the Heartland landfill with our system. So as I was just saying, uh, because we are going to use this uh, renewable natural gas into our system and displace us buying conventional natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, um, that makes it uh, carbon neutral. And therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's a really simple way to achieve uh, carbon emissions. The great thing is that it is a drop-in replacement fuel, uh, fuel uh, so it can be used within the existing gas system that is already in place. It represents, we think, one of the quicker ways that we can help customers take climate action and reduce emissions, uh, but not have to go through more costly or expensive uh, retrofits because you are able to use the existing system. I like it when we can explain this in terms of what that uh, actually practically means. So, for example, what you're talking about there, uh, the capital region's greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced by 450,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide over the next 25 years. That's the same as removing about 4,000 cars from the road or heating 3,000 homes with a heat pump instead of oil. So that's the impact. This is this is kind of future proofing, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think what we're going to find as we talk about uh, energy going forward, um, there's going to be a lot of new innovation that's gonna change our energy mix. But we also have to look at the energy systems we have in place and think of how do we optimize those, right? And one of the ways we can do that is using what's already in place and think about how do we decarbonize. You know, a perfect example is the electric system. You know, in many regions, coal-fired electricity um, it would create a electron that would go down a, a, a electric wire into the home. Uh, issues with say coal uh, as a carbon uh, producer in generation uh, didn't mean you cut the wires, you found lower carbon forms of electricity and moved down those wires. So this is an analogy. Uh, continuing to use the 50,000 kilometers of gas lines we have installed across the province uh, and find a way to put a lower carbon product into the system. Now, it's going to take a while. Like we're starting, we're starting small. We've got a target in 2030 to have about 15% of our natural gas come from renewable sources, both in the province, but also we're buying renewable natural gas from out of province. But overall, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, a shift to more renewable gaseous energy. So we talked at the very beginning about the fact that our demand for energy is going to be increasing as the population grows, as industry grows and things like that uh, here, well, in greater, greater Victoria, as well as all over BC. So that planning that you're doing to address that demand for energy, what does energy savings and conservation, how does that factor into this too? Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, energy efficiency and conservation, it has a significant role to play in both climate action taking climate action, but also affordability. Look, as our population grows, we're going to have a large increase in energy demand. Uh, but at the same time, we're starting to see it already. We are seeing some impacts of, of, of climate change. We're facing more extreme peak uh, weather demands. Uh, uh, so dealing both with greater energy demand, but more peak energy, uh, energy efficiency and conservation becomes critical in how we lower our overall capital energy, uh, our overall energy com consumption, sorry, per capita. Um, that'll help us reduce emissions. But by using less energy overall as energy demand grows, we're also avoiding costly energy infrastructure expenditures. Think about um, becoming more efficient with the infrastructure we have uh, by using less energy, uh, it avoids uh, expanding um, uh, the energy system for what will become uh, more peak energy demand, if you will, over time. What about the, what about the affordability factor of all that as we move forward too? Yeah, I, I would say the affordability issue is is going to be challenging. So uh, I'll say two comments on on affordability. I think is really worth noting as we transition to uh, lower emitting energy sources. Um, as we think more about greater energy demand. I think when we think about energy as a critical service, we are going to see more pressure on costs as we think about uh, bringing on, again, lower carbon energy, but also bringing on or building more energy infrastructure to support the overall demand. We also have to think about how do we manage a system that needs to be more resilient uh, and build in that kind of capacity. So the way we're thinking about it, 
really is in two ways. One is every uh, molecule or electron we don't use is a, a molecule or an electron that we don't have to pay for. So energy efficiency has a significant role in reducing overall energy use, which reduces overall bills. Uh, the other thing is, is that to the extent that we can optimize our existing energy infrastructure, both our electric and our gas system, to work in a more integrated uh, fashion to deal with uh, growing energy demand, uh, that'll be a way to avoid very costly update upgrades to our energy infrastructure and combined lower energy usage, uh, a more optimal approach to energy planning will help mitigate higher rates. Uh, you know, like all critical service providers, all critical infrastructure, there's more and more demands being placed on that infrastructure. You do have cost pressures. Utilities historically, I think, have done a good job uh, because we are regulated and we have a, a, a fairly open and transparent approach to rate setting with our customer groups. Um, we've done a reasonable manage a job managing uh, uh, rate increases, rate pressures. Uh, we do have some tools to to play in how we manage rate pressures, but I do think uh, energy efficiency will become more critical. But also, we do have to accept that we do have to invest in our system for things that hopefully we never see, things like resiliency. Um, investing in the system to make it more climate resilient, you may not see the benefit if nothing happens. Um, you'll see the benefit when those investments ensure that we maintain uh, service at critical peak times. So, you know, I think we've always got a, a, a view to affordability as as uh, utilities serving British Columbia. Um, and it's really a question of, uh, I think, how do we manage uh, our overall energy use? And, and I will think, I will also say, one of the things we have to think about is how do we manage the pace of these investments? So uh, affordability is, is top of mind. Uh, it is very much a focus for us as a utility, I know it's a focus for BC Hydro as well, uh, and it's something that um, uh, you know we've got our eye on and we're trying to work through. I mean, it's all that conversation about cost of living. So we, where I am, Greater Victoria, the Greater Victoria Chamber, is an area with a pretty solid infrastructure. And where you are, Lower Mainland, has a very major infrastructure in place. But you also provide energy to more remote areas in British Columbia and on Vancouver Island. And I want to talk about that next. Roger Dell'Antonio is our guest today. He is the CEO of Fortis, uh, one of the, the largest energy provider in BC, as a matter of fact. So yeah, Roger, you're in, uh, you said you're in Surrey today, and I'm in Victoria, but there's people in Campbell River, there's people in Port Alberni, places like that where you are serving them as well. How does the energy get to them? Yeah, so uh, on the island, we uh, we really see our service, start, if you think about the map of Vancouver Island, we're along the east coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, from Campbell River all the way down to Victoria, the CRD, and out to Souk. And we also provide, as you noted, uh, service to the city of Port Alberni. Um, you know, our system uh, is a province-wide system. Uh, we take uh, natural gas, uh, uh, gaseous energy off of the Enbridge system that, that starts up in northeast uh, BC, goes down the middle of, uh, uh, of the province as a backbone system, um, we pick up uh, off of the Enbridge system and then uh, have a transmission system, uh, the coastal transmission system that brings gas from Vancouver mainland uh, over onto Dexada and then out uh, around Campbell River. And then we have a pipeline system that was built uh, of 1990, 1991 to bring natural gas onto Vancouver Island. Uh, and then we have that backbone system along the East Coast and then again serving over to Port Alberni. And then the communities along the way will have laterals off of that transmission system to bring gas into Nanaimo, um, uh, into uh, the various cities, into the, the CRD. Uh, so we have what we call two elements to our system. We have a backbone transmission system. That's the bigger pipes that moves uh, uh, most of the gas. And then we drop that off into the distribution system, the low pressure system in the various uh, communities along the pipeline system. I've been on Vancouver Island since 2001. And as you mentioned, Fortis and that ga gas service is relatively new in 2001. People were still saying, hey, we're going to get hooked up to gas. We're going to have that as an option. Uh, yeah. Take a look ahead for me now. What's this all going to look like in, say, 10 years? Do a little forecasting for me. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, this is a really a question about energy transition. Uh, and what I would say, um, when we think about the future, we look five years, 10 years, 20 years out, we undertake what's called long-term resource planning. Uh, those lay out uh, a variety of scenarios. We factor in different uh, population growth, different energy uh, resource usage, uh, different supply basins, different weather patterns, uh, adoption of different technologies like electric vehicles, um, the, the cost and availability of uh, renewable fuels like RNG, uh, different types of energy efficiency. So, uh, you know, net-net, it's a fairly complex exercise that we go through on a regular basis. Uh, I would say, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same in many ways. You know, at the end of the day, energy is always a critical service. We can never take our eye off of uh, making investments that focus on the safety of the system, the reliability of the system, the resiliency of the system. I will say I do see a future that has much more uh, availability of renewable fuels, be it renewable electricity or renewable gaseous energy. Uh, I also see the systems being used differently. I do see greater and greater penetration of electricity in different uh, sectors. Right now, electricity is about 20% end use energy. People use energy electricity every day, but I think they don't realize that it is not the largest energy use uh, provider in the province. Electricity, again, 18 to 20%, the gas system, a bit more than that. So when you think about what the future looks like, you know, we see forecasts going out towards 2050 where you're going to see electrification go from maybe 20% to something that's double to three times that amount. Um, but you're still going to have to manage the toughest part of the system, which is how do you have peak energy delivery for extreme weather events like winter peak. So when I think out 10 years, 20 years to 2050 and, and net zero horizon, I see both the electric and gas system working much closely together and dealing with uh, what, uh, what I see are the, are the strengths of both systems. I can tell you that in our house, we're very thankful that we have a, a gas fireplace because on those cold winter nights, it's nice to cuddle up and be warm because of the, <laughs> the heat generated by that. Um, Roger, we're out of time for this. I want to give you a big shout out for all the support you give for various community organizations, including the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate that. Uh, Roger Dallantonio is the CEO of Fortis BC and Fortis BC Energy Incorporated. Roger, thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chat.